Uh, the next speaker is, uh, uh, I can't remember, or Hannah Golden from University of Utah. Hi, good morning. I'd like to first thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm Hannah. I'm a postdoc in the Quan Lab at the University of Utah, where we study optic cup morphogenesis using zebrafish as our model. And today I'll be telling you about there we go, how hedgehog signaling regulates quarried fissure development and its role in a human developmental eye defect called coloboma. So first, Probably most of you are not familiar with this quarried fissure structure, so to introduce you, here I'm showing you a series of images depicting the various steps of both optic cup and quarried fissure development. So the quarried fissure is this opening, this narrow opening on the ventral side of the optic cup, and it extends through the optic stalk. Um, the optic cup and the quarried fissure develop at the same time during development, and uh, these fading red lines are here to indicate the transience of the structure. And this is because as development progresses, this fissure closes to form a critical tube by which vasculature can then enter the eye and retinal axons can then exit the eye. And we care about the choroid fissure because defects in development of the choroid fissure result in a condition called uveal coloboma, which is predicted to be the cause of an estimated 10% of pediatric blindness worldwide. And importantly, we don't really understand the cellular mechanisms underlying disease. Uh, some hints, however, have come from human genetic studies that have identified dozens of genes, including genes upstream, within, and downstream of the he hedgehog signaling pathway. Evidence for the conservation of hedgehog signaling in quarried fissure development has come um, a few years ago from Jeff Gross's lab, who identified the patch 2 mutant um, and showed that this embryo exhibits coloboma. So here I'm showing you two embryos at two hours, two days post-fertilization. Uh, we're looking at the back of this eye shown here, and in the wild type, we see uniform pigmentation and actually a tiny seam here, uh, which, uh, at, and this is because at this time point, the fissure has begun to fuse and form that tube. However, in the patch 2 mutants, we see this large area of hypopigmentation, and this is indicative of coloboma. So patch 2 uh, encodes for the hedgehog receptor and is normally a negative regulator of the pathway such that loss of function mutations in patch 2 result in overactive hedgehog signaling. So uh, just a recap, we know that increased hedgehog signaling results in altered uh, or disrupted quarried fissure development and that downstream can lead to coloboma and blindness. And so for today's talk, we'll be investigating um, how overactive hedgehog signaling disrupts the formation of the quarried fissure. So for these types of morphogenesis questions, um, our lab takes a live imaging approach. And to start to familiarize you with the types of tools that we use, um, I'll be showing you a time-lapse movie of optocup morphogenesis as it occurs in a live embryo. So uh, on the right side, uh, there's, these are the various steps, and you can follow along. We're looking at a dorsal view of an, of an embryo that's been uniformly labeled with uh, GFP for membranes and um, M-cherry for chromatin. Uh, here is one optic vesicle. It's already emerged from the uh, midline region shown here, which is the per perspective brain. The other optic vesicle is up here out of the field of view. And I'll walk you through the steps as I play the movie. So first, we have elongation of the optic vesicle in the posterior direction. At the same time, a furrow forms between the midline region and the optic vesicle. And this moves anteriorly to constrict the optic stalk. The neural retina thick, thickens, the retinal pigment epithelium thins and spreads around the back of the eye as, as the lens emerges from the overlying ectoderm. And optic cup morphogenesis is complete at 24 hours post-fertilization. So we set out to ask three questions that we thought were central to understanding the mechanism by which overactive hedgehog signaling regulates quarried fissure formation. And the first is simply, how is quarried fissure morphogenesis disrupted in our patch two mutants? So to understand this question fully, we first needed to understand how the quarried fissure forms in a wild-type scenario. So here I'm showing you a wild-type embryo at 24 hours per fertilization. This is a 3D rendering of a lateral view. So I'll uh, center you. Here's our lens and our neural retina. And the quarried fissure, we can see, is formed and present at this time point. Um, and this is this um, narrow opening on the ventral side of the optic cup. And I've also demarked this, um, these margins, uh, the temporal margin and the nasal margin, with red dotted lines here. So to understand how this structure forms, we utilized a cell tracking software that we had previously established at the University of Utah um, called Long Tracker. And this allows us to um, 
uh, pick nuclei, which we've pseudocolored from uh, multiple groups here, um, and backtrack them in time within our 4D data set. So doing, in doing this, we uh, saw that these embryos or, or these cells originate from a very small region within the embryo uh, with one key difference that these temporal cells are already in the optic cup or in the optic vesicle. Uh, however, these nasal and stalk cells are still reside within the midline region. So as they play this movie, again, we'll be able to watch cell movements as they occur in a wild type embryo in, in a live embryo um, to contribute to the optic cup. So we, these cells take a, a path anterior, then lateral, and then a final posterior hook, where temporal cells lead, followed by nasal cells, followed by stock cells. And we call this um, a J-shaped trajectory. So we wanted to see how these cell movements are altered in a patch 2 mutant. And I'll first uh, remind you just again of this structure uh, in a wild type, where the temporal margin and the nasal margin of the choroid fissure are very close together. Um, and already in our patch 2 mutant at the same time point, we see uh, a, a very different structure. So um, the choroid fissure is much more open and cavernous, and the temporal and nasal margin are much further apart. So applying the same cell tracking techniques, uh, we saw that all three cell populations originate from a different location within the embryo. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to these cells right here. And this is because these cells um, in a wild type embryo would normally make it all the way to the optic cup and they would contribute to the nasal margin of the choroid fissure. However, as I play this movie, um, we see that these cells either exit the midline too, too late or they migrate too slowly in general to make it all the way to the optic cup whereas these uh, nasal cells appear to exhibit a, a wild-type J-shaped trajectory. So at this point, we'd identified these cells as particularly aberrant in the patch 2 mutant embryo. So we next wanted to ask whether these populations of cells um, exhibit individual, other individual characteristics that might clue us into what's happening. Um, so we, to visualize this, we utilized the, the photoactivatable fluorophore chiata and photoactivated this region within the wild-type embryo. And as I play this movie, you, we can see that these cells exit the midline region, uh, adopt a bipolar morphology, move processively through the optic stalk and into the optic cup, um, and can contribute to the ventral nasal region of the optic cup and the nasal margin of the choroid fissure, shown here. In the patch 2 mutant, however, although some cells appear wild type, the vast majority of these cells uh, take on an aberrant multipolar morphology and cease movement um, and remain stuck in the optic stalk. So we next wanted to ask uh, whether this was cell autonomous or non-cell autonomous, that is to say that uh, if, if hedgehog signaling is acting in the environment or within the migrating cells. Um, and to answer this question, we utilized the two phenotypes um, that I just described to you that uh, in the patch 2 mutant, we see aberrant multipolar morphology and that cells remain stuck in the optic stock. Um, and we combine this, these phenotypes with standard blastula cell transplantation techniques. So briefly, I remove cells from a patch 2 homozygous mutant and transplant them into a wild type or patch 2 mutant embryo, and I target the eye field. And questions such as these allow us to ask how patch 2 mutant cells move in a wild type embryo and vice versa. So for the purposes of time, I'll just be able to answer this one question for you. And I'll tell you that when I transplant mutant cells into a mutant embryo, we recapitulate our mutant phenotype. However, we wanted to ask what happens when we transplant mutant cells into a wild type um, uh, environment? Do they behave wild type or do they behave um, in this mutant manner? So here I'm showing you again a dorsal view of patch 2 homozygous mutants in magenta here uh, in a wild type host where membranes are marked in green. Um, and you'll notice that these cells are in this area again uh, that we identified in a patch 2 mutant where these um, are exhibit mutant phenotypes. So as I play this movie, and I'll follow it with my mouse here, uh, we see that these cells exit the midline, move processively through the optic stock, ab adopt a bipolar morphology, and cont contribute to both the uh, ventral nasal region of the optic cup, and this cell in particular contributes to the nasal margin of the choroid fissure. So that these cells act, seem to be acting wild type, uh, our conclusion thus far is that overactive hedgehog signaling acts at least in uh, the surrounding cells in a non-cell autonomous manner to uh, disrupt choroid fissure cell movements. And again, I mentioned these experiments are ongoing, so we're um, testing this is um, at least part of our conclusion. So we finally wanted to ask, what are the downstream signaling mechanisms by which overactive hedgehog signaling disrupts these cell movements? And in particular, we wanted to know whether glee-dependent transcription was re required. 
So here I'm showing you a grossly oversimplified uh, version of the hedgehog signaling pathway where in the absence of ligand, patched represses the transmembrane protein smoothened. However, in the presence of ligand or in our genetic loss of function mutants, this repression of smoothened is relieved and smoothened facilitates downstream processing of the glee transcription factors to their activator form, which can then uh, turn on downstream target genes. So we genetically tested it, our hypothesis um, under the... Um, under the assumption that if uh, GLE downstream transcription of target genes was required in a patch to mutant to result in a coloboma phenotype, that removal of GLE should rescue our phenotype. And in fact, this is what we see. So here I'm showing a patch to homozygous mutants and uh, in a GLE1 wild type background, and we see a penetrance of 60% of our embryos have coloboma. This is in accordance with previously published literature that this is an incompletely penetrant phenotype. Um, however, when we remove one or two copies of GLE, we see a drastic reduction in, our, um, in the percent of animals with coloboma. So although these experiments are ongoing, our number is a little bit low here, um, we think that we can, it's safe to say that uh, overactive hedgehog signaling acts at least in part through GLE1-dependent uh, transcription of downstream, downstream target genes. So I'll mention one caveat here. Um, you'll notice that we do not see complete rescue of our phenotype, and there are two other glees in, uh, in zebrafish, um, and so we are testing these as well. So in conclusion, uh, we set out to identify how overactive hedgehog signaling disrupts choroid fissure formation, and I told you that we identified a specific population of cells that reside within the midline region that adopt an aberrant multipolar morphology and cease movement um, after, and remain stuck in the optic stock that this is at least in part due to non-cell autonomous mechanisms, but is downstream of GLEE1. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank the lab, uh, our collaborators who have been extremely helpful, uh, the University of Utah, uh, which is an excellent place to be, and our funding sources, and I'll take any questions. And does the overactivation of uh, hedgehog signaling uh, promote uh, cell, per, uh, cell proliferation or inhibit uh, cell proliferation? Did you check it? Yes, we have checked. Um, we don't see an increase in cell proliferation in our oh, patch yeah. two mutants. So uh, thanks for a great talk. It, it, it seems the simplest explanation is that the cells um, in the patch to mutant are simply specified to be ventral diencephalon instead of optic stock. Is that, is that what you're thinking, or, or is there another? So we're, we're uh, that's, a, that's, yeah. So we're currently staining for PAX2, which is um, an optic stock marker. Um, and so that is one hypothesis that we're currently studying, but we haven't, we don't know the answer yet. How do you explain your transplant results? So why do you think it's not autonomous? Yeah, this is really surprising. So um, we, we think that pos probably the simplest explanation is that um, maybe neighboring cells are um, increasing cell adhesion type molecules and maybe that's resulting in our multipolar morphology. Um, one thing that we, that might be interesting to test with our transplants is um, I've started looking at the migration of single cells versus a larger group of cells, um, and this might also help tease out um, that possibility. <laughs>